Foreign Matter with the Witness to War Foundation. It is November 5th, 2013, and we are at the Evergreen Air and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. I'm sitting with Richard Orozco, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-O-R-O-S-C-O, -O -O who serves in the Korean War as well as Desert Storm and the United States Army and the United States Air Force, respectively. In the Army, he served in the 40th Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, and in the Air Force, he was in the 63rd Wing, 445th, Aircraft Generation Squadron. How are you doing today, sir? That's, that's, that's good, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. My first question is, where are you from originally? I was born in Escondido, California in 1932, so that makes me 81 now. <laughs> yeah. And how did you come to join the military? Throughout World War II, I was a youngster of 10, 11, 12, 13. And at that time, I used to read newspaper. There was no television. There was radio and newspaper. I used to read about these places in Europe and Asia. And I started playing soldier when I was that age. And then when I became 17, I enlisted in the National Guard with my mother's consent. And one year later, on September 1st, the 40th Infantry National Guard was activated into federal service to go serve in Korea. My birthday was September 3rd. We were activated September 1st. Hell Week and football started August 28th. I missed it. Um, we left Anaheim on September 1st by train to go to Camp Cook, California, which is now Vandenberg Air Force Base. I arrived in Camp Cook and two weeks later we were into basic training. Immediately after basic training in December, there was a call for volunteers to go to Korea. They needed 20 soldiers from each infantry company to volunteer. A couple of days before this list came out, I had volunteered for the Ranger course. I took the physical, but the Korean list took preference over the Rangers. And so immediately they had us go through AIT, which is advanced infantry training for three days. Normally this takes uh, up to six weeks, but this is a rush course. Then they sent us home uh, for a 10 day furlough for Christmas. After the 10 day furlough, I left uh, home on uh, December 28th, arrived in Seattle. December 29th and spent New Year's Eve on Seattle at Seattle. And we boarded ship on the US Marine Hayes and left for Korea. Actually we stopped at Yokohama, Japan uh, for overnight and then we left for Korea. I arrived in Korea on January 28th. And after they dropped me off on January 28th, uh, immediately after this, on February 1st, I found out that we were surrounded by 25,000 Chinese, North Korean, Mongolian fighters. Our regiment was completely surrounded and cut off. There was no ties with the outside world. And uh, one day, airdrops came in by parachute, and this was food, ammunition. I asked my squad leader, or I made a comment saying, oh, uh, supply trucks cannot keep up with us, right? He said, no, Richard, you're surrounded. We can't get supplies up here. We're completely, totally surrounded. 
And I realized then what was happening. And this place was known as Chip Young Knee and the Twin Tunnel Battle. Three days after I arrived, I was in a major battle. And uh, we fought for three days. It was a short battle because out of the 25,000 enemy, they had suffered 16,000 casualties. We had tore them up and they started to maintain their ground. But then, to the grace of God, the first cavalry, miles away, charged with tanks loaded with soldiers. This was a no-no. You don't do that, but this colonel took it upon himself to break through. And this is a tactic he used later on. He was reprimanded for doing what he did, but he accomplished the mission. He broke through miles and miles of Chinese soldiers and got to this 23rd Regiment and broke us out. And uh, after the Twin Tunnel Chip Yang Ni battle, we were online still fighting. And then on May 1st, there was another major battle. May Day is the main communist holiday. That's what they live for. And uh, that's when they start their offensive. Well, they attacked the 2nd Division we held. As we were holding them, the 187th Airborne landed behind enemy lines 20 miles behind the Chinese who were engaged with us. Then we made a major push and started pushing them north towards the 187th Airborne. They didn't know this, but when they got 18, 20 miles north, they ran into the 187th Airborne. Therefore, the name, the May Massacre came about. Uh, they were just trapped between the Airborne and the 2nd Division. Also in May, on May 21st, I had a personal good friend of mine. I, I had been in the National Guard with him and I traveled from Anaheim to Seattle. We traveled on the same ship. He was in the uh, 38th Regiment and they were trapped, they were surrounded. The 23rd tried to make an attempt to rescue them. We got within miles and then we were on the verge of being outflanked. But before that, uh, I recall that I was a point man, the first scout for the company, about 100 yards away from the main body. And uh, I was out there and uh, I could hear a burp gun just feet away from me, just 30 feet, 40 feet in front. Lieutenant Reinhardt, my platoon leader, called me on the radio and told me, Richard, we're sending a relief for you. And I said, yes, sir. And uh, I'm looking towards the front, but I, my eye was, I would turn to my rear to look out for this guy that was gonna relieve me. Well, he came running. And when I saw him running, I, I yelled, down, down, get down. And he wouldn't get down, he ran up right where I was laying down above me and he got shot right through the, took a bullet right between his eyes. He fell on top of me. Uh, it was pretty emotional for me. I, I, I told this guy to get down. I don't know if he didn't hear me or was in a hurry to get to me. And then I called Lieutenant Reinhardt and I said, the, the relief you sent me just got killed. And he says, okay, we're gonna send some other people. I said, wait a minute, sir. Don't let them approach me standing up. Make them crawl because there's a sniper within feet away from me. 
he said, uh, thank you, and he sent a party of uh, three other people to go after this body, this young kid. And then he told me to leave immediately with them that the enemy is trying to outflank us. We have to go back. And we went back about uh, three miles and went out to our right flank to meet the enemy there, and they were there. What they had planned on doing was falling back and then encircling us. When we got up there, uh, there was no place to dig foxholes. There was solid rock about three inches into the ground. Nobody could dig in, and they were being shot. I was on the reverse slope, and they were on the forward slope, and they were getting shot, and I was watching wounded personnel running away, bleeding, hit, but able to walk. And then I saw people that were not wounded. And I told my friend Raul Mendoza, I said, something is up, something's up. And after they left, one sole person, his name is Marcus Begay. He was the other Native American in my platoon. He was called chief number one. I was called chief number two. He came by my hole and said, get the F out of here. They're going to come down on you. So we left with him. We withdrew about uh, 150 yards down the ridge line, and we stopped there. And then we didn't make a perimeter. We were just in two platoons one on forward slope, one on the reverse slope. Lieutenant Reinhardt got a call that he has, to t he has to take back that knoll and that position at all cost. So he yelled, fix bayonets. And I have an automatic weapon, BAR, but it can be fixed with a bayonet. And so pl two platoons fixed bayonets, and he led the charge. And 20 feet away, we saw a silhouette of a person near a lone tree on top of this, on top of the hill. One lone person, everybody opened up. We did not know that we were killing one of our own through friendly fire. We didn't know this until we kept charging with bayonets. As we were charging, I'm thinking to myself, this is a typical John Wayne movie. <laughs> this is what I was thinking. I said, this is the way John Wayne would have done it. And I fired from the hip, and then I raised my, my automatic weapon and fired from the shoulder, and then down because it was heavy, and we kept charging. And then a little over halfway to the final objective, Lieutenant Reinhardt was shot several times on his right shoulder, right leg, flesh wound, right left side. He hesitated, went down on one knee, threw his rifle away, took out his 45 revolver, his right shoulder was gone, he put it in the left shoulder, and then he told us to keep on going, follow him. He inspired two platoons to follow him. We proceeded, charging the hill, thinking hand-to-hand -hand combat, but that didn't come about because we had killed the eight Chinese that were in the foxholes by heavy small arms fire. We killed them all, and uh, there was no hand-to-hand -hand combat, but it came close. This, And all this time, I'm thinking John Wayne would have done it this way, so why can't we? Um, we recaptured the position. They put me on the forward slope, and I was drawing fire all around me. I couldn't dig in, so I went up to the top and took cover 
and immediately when I got up on there, Lieutenant Reinhardt got orders to abandon the objective because, again, they're going to go around our right flank and cut us off again. So we left, and as we left, uh, we got down to the bottom of this long valley, and we got on uh, Army transportation uh, trucks. As we were driving away, I, I looked back and I saw this lone, grassy hill with one tree. And I was thinking of that one person that we had killed with friendly fire. They retrieved his body, but I remembered uh, that, why did this happen? So we, we proceeded back about five or six miles, and uh, we were on a slope at the south end of the valley, and uh, we're expecting a major, major attack. Later on, as I was watching and looking down the valley with binoculars, I could see three long, long columns of Chinese troops coming our way. There was maybe over 1,000 of them. And I called Lieutenant Reinhardt to go to my position. He came over to my position, and I gave him the binoculars. And he had his radio man call battalion headquarters and battalion headquarters, of course, of course called regimental. And, and within minutes, we had uh, FOs from the forward observers from the Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy. And they were plotting the operation they were going to perform, air support. Um, Ten minutes after they left, here comes a Navy fighters in a huge circle with the lead off dropping his load and, and firing 40 millimeter cannon, 20 millimeter cannon, napalm and bombs in, the, in this valley. And ten minutes later, uh, they leave and here comes a Marine Corps. And they did the same thing. After the Marines left, the Air Force came in. And by that time, the Navy went back to the aircraft carriers, reloaded, and they were ready again. There was no let up. And they had destroyed the entire, well, they didn't destroy the entire column, but they kind of discouraged them from attacking us. They were like, wiped out. Uh, that night, um, let me go back to the afternoon. Uh, during uh, the afternoon, we had uh, tanks, half tracks, in between the infantry. We had heavy artillery, 105s, 155s, rockets, we had uh, mortars, heavy mortars, light mortars. And that night, uh, in that 24-hour period, w this regiment had set a record for the number of rounds expanded in 24-hour period. There was the Air Force uh, from the Navy, Marines, Navy, Navy, Marines, and Air Force, and all of the supporting fires. And that night, uh, we opened up fire. Somebody thought they heard something, they started firing. The whole line opens up with all the supporting fires. And during this time, uh, there was a, a couple hundred flares lighting up the entire valley. It was like daylight at night. But uh, there was no enemy. The next morning, I volunteered for a patrol. 
and we went out about a, about one mile, and here's the dead bodies all over the place. I mean, they were just, it was just littered with dead bodies from bombardment of air support, Navy support, artillery, mortars. Uh, they could not launch any kind of a major attack. And our patrol went back, and uh, that fight was over too. And from May, we went uh, into July, then August, we went to the Punch Bowl. At the Punch Bowl, we ran uh, patrols across the valley. And what was the Punch Bowl like when you arrived? The punch bowl is exactly what it in, uh, entails. It, it's like a, uh, a mountain range in a round form. There's a north and south side of the, of the uh, punch bowl. And to our east, the Marine Corps was facing Bloody Ridge and Heartbreak Ridge. We were facing the punch bowl. And we were there for about a month and a half. And then on September 10th, the Marine Corps switched places with the 2nd Infantry. We moved here, they moved to the punch bowl. It was kind of like a tactic to off throw the enemy intelligence. And uh, we attacked Bloody Ridge, the 9th Infantry took credit for the attack on Bloody Ridge. The Marine Corps had tried something they had never done before. They had large Chinook aircraft, uh, helicopters. This was the first time that they had ever attacked by helicopter. They flew, them, they flew them from the south brim of the valley to the north brim and had a landing zone up there. They took the punch bowl in six days, six short days because of their tactic. Well, the army on, on the left attacking Bloody Ridge, we, we didn't use helicopters. Um, I recall that uh, September 3rd, I was on Bloody Ridge. That was my birthday. I turned 19. And I recall an incident on September 2nd where I was looking into a, a valley and wooded area. I was looking there with my binoculars and I saw a round circle of smoke come out of the forest then I heard the pro projectile leave the tube. And after you're there for a couple of weeks or months, you can detect when it's going to be close or far from you. Well, this is going to be a close one. Apparently, they zeroed in on my foxhole because that mortar landed four feet, four feet from my foxhole. I suffered a concussion and loss of hearing. It slammed up my, it slammed my head against the foxhole and then I started to bleed. Was I, anyone else in the foxhole with you? No, uh, no, I was alone. Sometimes you had to be alone in a foxhole because we didn't have that many personnel. And this was one time. I uh, kind of, uh, I, I couldn't hear it and I had to report it. I, I went back to my squad leader and, and I, I, went, I went like this and, and he talked to me and, I, and he knew that I was deaf. So he sent me down to the company uh, CP overnight. Uh, gradually, my hearing came back, and the next day I was I was okay. But I still had the concussion. But you don't you don't. Uh, 
if you're gung-ho, that doesn't bother you. So I went back to my company, and I was up there with uh, my CO. He was about six foot six. And uh, he said, Richard, uh, you're out of uniform. And I said, yeah, I know, sir, I'm out of uniform. The thing is that my, my trousers were torn from the, from the top to my heel. I only had one half of my pants on, my, my fatigues. He was joking with me, of course, when he said, you're out of uniform. I was literally out of the uniform. And he said, by the way, uh, Richard, uh, when we get down, uh, I, want, I want you to be my driver, Jeep driver. Have you got military license? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And uh, we continued the attack uh, on uh, Bloody Ridge. And then my birthday was sep September 3rd, which was the next, next day after the incident. As I was uh, looking out of my foxhole, I saw this huge, huge, massive mountain north. And I wrote a letter to my mother that day. And I said, Mom, uh, there's a huge mountain in front of us. And I said, I wonder who's going to take it. And little did I know that it was going to be the 23rd Regiment. And so September 12th, Charlie Company took the first objective of Heartbreak Ridge, which was Hill 721, I believe. That was the first objective. The rest of the regiment went through Hill 721 and continued the attack. And uh, they went up to 851. And uh, there was another nine something, and then the main objective of the of the entire operation was Hill 931. That was the highest peak of this ridge. This ridge of heartbreak ran eight miles from east to west, eight miles long. 931 was the highest peak. And after 721, we went up to the ridge line of Heartbreak Ridge. Incidentally, incidentally by the way, um, later on I, I found out why it was named Heartbreak Ridge. I read it in a book that I have. The division commander was having a press conference with United Press and Associated Press. They asked him about this mountain, and he said, it breaks my heart to see these young men dying up there. And Associated Press and United Press got together and, and named that ridge line Heartbreak Ridge. That's how it got, got its name. Um, I recall going along the ridge line. It was a very, very sharp ridge line. It was only a path along the ridge line. And we were under heavy fire, and there was boulders along the path, and you had to go from one boulder to the next. And as you were doing that, you would get fired on. And we continued, and uh, I saw one incident that I'll never forget. I got to a boulder, and here was the first sergeant with four POWs. As I got next to him, he shot one of the POWs right to the head, and then another one. And I cringed as I saw this, um, and I understood, too, that we were so short of personnel that we could not escort them down. It was impossible. We, we, we couldn't afford to 
have anybody take him down, so we had, he had to uh, execute him. And that day I continued, but I kept thinking about what I had seen.